been dead for quite a few years, back in the 1800s, and like, uh, like he said, he's, some people want to live and work within the sound of a church bell. He goes, I want to run a rescue shop three feet from hell. And like I said, I think we found it. It's a great place to be. Um, you know, you got to be careful. You never know. You know, you could be just minding your own business like I was. Next thing I knew, I was a chaplain for a truck stop. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, in one day. Um, real short testimony. Uh, me and my wife were living the high life. We had a million dollar house up in Rancho Cucamonga. I was driving Barbara Streisand's Lexus convertible. She was driving her nice Lexus GX 470. She's a professional artist. I don't know if you guys saw some of the pictures in the background in the chapel. Those were all hers. Uh, in fact, we used to go down to um, uh, where they're having the uh, uh, Spirit West Coast and she used to go down there and sell her art. So, uh, we don't know anything about truck driving. In fact, if I had to drive a truck right now, I'm in big trouble. Because I have no idea how to even start one. But you know what? Uh, um, just, you know what? Just look. Look for opportunities and just keep an open heart. You never know what God might do with your life. Um, I'm looking around here. I would say most of us are about three quarters. Maybe a couple of you guys got a little bit more than that. But most of us are probably about three quarters done with our life. What are you going to do with the last quarter? You know, you're going to stand in front of God and go, geez, Jesus, thank you so much for what you did. And, I, don't know, I guess I didn't do really a whole lot for you. And of course, we know it's not about works. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But you know what? Uh, just look for that calling. Amen. And uh, this morning, we're going to look at a guy that had that calling. Um, uh, you know, it's amazing in the Bible, in every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, two words. Two words change people's lives. Can you imagine you working here for Paul, and all of a sudden you're you're just rocking or you're rocking out doing your work, and all of a sudden you hear that calling, "Follow me." And you say, "Paul, I'll see you later." You drop your machine to take off. That's what some of these guys did. That's what we're going to see this morning. Uh, turn to the book of Acts. Hope you guys got Bibles because we're going to be going uh, through this a little bit. Um, Acts chapter 26. And what I'm going to do, we're only going to go to verse 40. But what I'm going to do is we're going to read it and then we're going to come back and take a look at it. Okay, so Acts chapter 8 verse 26. And while you're uh, turning, I'll go ahead and pray. Lord, we just come before you this morning, Lord. Father, we thank you for just an awesome day, Lord. And Father, we thank you for Paul. Lord, a man that has a vision. A man that has a calling on his heart, he doesn't care what the world says. He's going to put it out there because he knows. He knows. Lord, I thank you, Father, for Trinity, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you just keep blessing them, Lord. Father, we all know we can't outgive you. So I pray, Lord, Father, that you would just bless not just Paul, but all the servants here, all the employees. Father, give them grace, mercy, and, of course, favor. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, you guys, here we go. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he rose and went, and behold, a man, a Ethiopian, Ethiopia eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet, verse 29, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake his chariot, verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. This is Isaiah 23, or Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 through 8. It says, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And he, and who will desire his generation, for his life is taken from the earth. Verse 34. 
So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went his way, went his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Astos, and passing through, he preached all the cities till he came to Caesarea. A little bit about Philip. His name means Philippos. That's how you say it, Philippos. Um, it, and what it means is a lover of horses, or fond of horses. So if your name is Philip here, or you know any Philips, that's what it means, fond of horses. Um, Philip was one of the 12 disciples. He was obviously born in Bethsaida. Interesting enough that Philip was a Jew with a Greek name. A Jew with a Greek name. In fact, the only other disciple to have a Jew to have a Greek name was Andrew. So that was kind of a neat thing. Um, tradition says that, uh, again, this is just tradition, not biblical. It says that 30 years after the crucifixion, Philip the Apostle went to Britain founded the church of Glastonbury, to which Joseph of Arimathea brought the Holy Grail, the cup used at the Last Supper. Uh, we know that uh, he was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified in 54 AD. Which was interesting, you know, because out of all the prophets, there's only one that actually didn't die a martyr's death. Who was that? John. John. Not John the Baptist. We know what happened to him, right? Uh, John. The, the, John, the Apostle John. Now, Interesting, in Matthew, or in John 1, verse 33, if you read that, you'll see where Jesus saw Philip. He said, Philip, follow me. That was it. That's all he said, follow me. He dropped everything he did and followed him. Also, in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, there was another person that uh, did that. Remember Matthew, the tax collector? Uh, in fact, you know, Matthew's name is an interesting name. His name is actually is... Uh, um, Lewis, when you say Matthew, his name is Matthew, also known as the Levi. The word Levi is where we get our word Lewis. In fact, when you see, when you say Levi in the Greek, it's actually Lewis. And of course, we know that's a, a good Jewish name. And then also, uh, follow me was Peter and Andrew. Now, Jesus said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So, you know, a lot of people, did you know that was interesting? Do you know that? Some people have to hear the gospel eight times. I don't know where they get that number, but eight times before they come to Christ. Interesting. Eight times. Here we read, Jesus saw them and said, follow me. Before you know it, there they go. Now, let's look at um, verse 29 here. It says, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Now, you've got to understand, if you read Luke, I mean, I'm sorry, if you read Acts 8 through 4 through 8, it talks about Philip just came off a great, great evangelism, uh, talking to um, people in Caesarea. Many were getting saved. Many were getting healed. And all of a sudden, God says, you know what, Philip? Uh, I want you to take a little shortcut, and we're going to go into the desert. And, um, you know, you would think, now, how foolish is that? I mean, you're, you're in a place where you're prospering. Many people are getting saved. Why would you want to go 50 miles away to a desert? Here's why. Because God said to go. Simple as that. God says go, you go. Now, let me tell you, I mean, I can talk from, talk from experience. Uh, we were doing pretty good. And I'm thinking, Lord, why do I want to leave this and go to a truck stop? I have nothing in common with truck drivers. And the Lord says, you know what? I will give you a heart. I will give you a desire. 
See, before what God calls you, or before I should say God calls you into a ministry, you don't have to know anything really about that ministry per se. Number one, God will give you a desire. You know what's interesting? The Bible talks about God's will. Everybody wants to be in God's will. If you're a Christian, you should be praying, God, what is your will for my life? Well, let me give you a little secret here. The word will in the Greek, you're going to love this, is the word desire. God will give you a desire. Like I said, I didn't have a desire to be with truck drivers. Now, I will say this much. I was there for 16 years as a volunteer. But that's like a couple times a month. I mean, that's not going in and saying, okay, here I am. Let's, you know, let's get serious with this. God had to give me a desire. And he will give you a desire. If you, want, if you want ministry, you just pray. First of all, Lord, where do you want me to go? And please give me a desire. Now, what is he doing? He's going to go to Gaza. This is desert. So what does he do? So he arose and he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under the Candace, under Candace the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a couple of things here. First of all, Philip was submissive to God's plan, wasn't he? He could have said, you know what, God, look, no, find somebody else. I don't want to go to the desert. I'm doing real fine here. I got a great ministry. Just keep me right here. But no, Philip was submissive. You know, that's, that's one of the main keys to Christianity in our walk with Jesus. You got to be submissive. You got to be. Now, let's look at this about the Ethiopian. Did you know that the word Ethiopian actually means African? African, the man, he was a black man. And we find out that they actually, the Ethiopians descended from Cush. Cush was the oldest son of Ham, uh, Noah's youngest son. You'll find that in Genesis 9, 18 through 19, and Genesis 10, 6 through 7. Did you know that the, youth, that the um, Ethiopians are mentioned 50 times in the Bible? 50 times. In fact, did you know that the, that the, the man that helped Jesus carry Jesus' cross was a black man? Yeah, he was a black man. God first mentions Ethiopia in the creation itself, the river that watered the Garden of Eden, Genesis 2.10, split into four giant rivers. The name of the first is Pison, that is in which encompasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. Did you also know that Zephaniah was half black? He was half an Ethiopian. We don't know too much about his mother. Also, it says in Zephaniah 1, the word of the Lord came unto Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hiscah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Did you know that Cushi means man of Ethiopia? And what's interesting, too, is he married Moses. His wife, his second wife, was an Ethiopian. His second wife. And you guys know the story about uh, um, his brother and his sister, Aaron and Miriam? Remember that little problem about him marrying a, a, an Ethiopian lady? And um, remember what happened to uh, uh, her? She ended up getting struck with leprosy. So, you know, all that to say this, be careful. Be careful. Let me give you an example. Our chapel, I, that's what I like about being down there. We have every race in the world. I mean, it's a city within a city. We have people from Russia to Ethiopia to Pomona to, I mean, and everything in between come to that truck stop. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And what's so awesome too is we stick right to the scriptures. We don't, we don't deviate with denominations because we get every denomination in the world that comes in there. God will do the dividing. His word does dividing. Then let's go on here and let's look at verse, uh, let's see, oh, okay, let's look at this. So what, he came to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. So this guy's all pumped up, all pumped up. And he's sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. Well, this is kind of interesting here, because... The word overtake, when I first read this, I'm thinking, overtake, it just sounds so overbearing, you know? Just go over there and overtake this guy. Well, that's not actually what the word means. The word actually in the Greek means to join. 
In other words, run out there and join him. And then the word join means to bond, to cleave, to adhere. Uh, literally means glue together. Or figuratively means to intimately connect in a soul knit friendship. Now, you know, this took a lot of boldness for Philip. You know, here he is. There's this unit going down in his chair. He's a big wig. And, and the, this, the Holy Spirit. Now, notice in your Bible here, when you read, you've got to be careful because there's some, some words, you give, if, if you read it, you might go, hmm, which spirit are we talking about? Well, in verse 29, you're, the word spirit there, the S is capitalized. So that tells you something. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Everybody has a spirit. You know, this year I call this the tent. And it works real good down there because everybody has a different color tent, if you will. So that kind of takes care of that little problem. Because like I said, we'll have a black man sitting here with an Ethiop, I mean with a, a Hispanic man over here and a, a, an Oriental man. And we, it's, it's so diversified. So we just say, look, don't, don't get hung up over the tent. Okay? I can remember doing a service one night and there was this uh, big old, big old man. I mean, I, I think he was from, uh, the way he talked, he sounded like he was from the south. And he was sitting way up there in the corner and we had a um, black man that was doing worship for us that, uh, that evening. And he was sitting up there in the front. And we were asking him, you know, well, tell us a little about you, about yourself, who you drive for. And he goes, look, let me tell you something. He says, before I accepted the Lord, he said, I would never be in this chapel here with that man over here. Well, let me, oh, oh, yeah, I get it, okay. And uh, that's what God does. God changes lives. It was so cool because the guy gets up, comes over to this guy, and they're over there hugging during the service, you know. <laughs> only, only God, only God. But here, Philip, it took some boldness. So he runs up there. But why did he do it? Because it was the Holy Spirit that told him. Remember, capital S, Holy Spirit. The other S, the small S, that's the spirit you have. You know, when you become born again, I'm sure you're familiar with that verse. Jesus said in John 3, 3, what? Unless we are born again, we will what? We will not even see the kingdom of God. You know, a lot of people think, well, I'll get in because... I'm a religious person, or I go to this church, and I go to that church, or I belong to that denomination. You know, that's not what God's all about. God's all about people, souls, one-on-one, -on -one, and he said, unless you're a born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. People go, well, how do I become born again? It's real simple. When you ask, when you what? You believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the Bible says we'll be saved. So here's Peter, I mean, here's Philip running up here to the Ethiopian. And again, this took some boldness. But I like what David Guzik said. Uh, David Guzik's a great, great, uh, good preacher, great preacher, I should say. Um, he used to be the professor for the college over in Europe. Now he took over Calvary Chapel, uh, Santa Barbara. Great teacher. I like what he said about this verse. He said, the Ethiopian was a rich man, a man of power, and at least in some way a celebrity. Yet Philip knew he needed Jesus just as much as anyone else. You know what's interesting? Have you ever, do you ever feel intimidated to go up to people that you know um, might be, you might say, well, they're one step ahead of me, or they're, they're, uh, um, you know, they're of this class or that class, or they make this amount of money or that. You know what? People are people. People are people. We don't need to fear important people. When God puts you in front of somebody, you just talk to them. But then he went on, he says, we often shrink back from speaking boldly about Jesus, and the world lets us know we shouldn't talk about such things. But does the world shrink back from cramming his gospel down our throats? How many people are upset when all sorts of immorality and lies are forced upon believers? We should be just as bold to the world about Jesus as the world is bold to us about sin. I like that. I like that. That, that doesn't mean we get in people's faces. That doesn't mean we, get, we are obnoxious about our faith. Not at all. Not at all. What we do is we wait for the Holy Spirit to speak to us, and when that opportunity arises... We go there. Now, I like in verse 30 here, it says, So Philip ran to him. Ran to him. This word ran is, is like an athlete competing in the ancient Greek games, advance speedily like an athlete moving toward with a full effort and direct purpose. You know, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, when God speaks to you, 
man, go for it. Just go. Because, you know, God has already set it up. You know, God doesn't go ups. You know, we do that all the time, right? You do something, oh, man, God, I shouldn't have done that. Oops. Trust me, God does not go ups. Not in his vocabulary. Not at all. So what does he do? So the Holy Spirit tells him, I want you to go over there and, and, and talk to the Ethiopian. So Philip ran to him. And when he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, he said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, Philip knew at that moment that God had given him an open door. He knew it. You know, God's not going to send you on a mission without having it all set up. That's just the way he works. So again, Philip knew, oh man, this is good. I'm ready to go. Now, notice two things that are going on here. Number one, first of all, God had arranged the meeting between Philip and the eunuch. That's why he told him, look, Philip, we're going to leave this good little thing over here, and we're going to go over here in the middle of the desert, a road that hardly anybody uses, because me being God already knows that this, youth, that this uh, Ethiopian is coming down the road. Have you ever noticed that happen in your life? Have you, do you have that much faith? How much faith do you really have? How much faith do we really need? You know, we have a little bowl. In fact, last time... Um, uh, I spoke for Trinity, I spoke over at, at the other one, over in Santa Fe Springs, and I did it on faith. And I brought a little bowl of mustard seeds. I mean, those things are so tiny, I mean, if you pick one up, you could accidentally drop it, they're so small. But yet, Jesus said, if you just have the faith of that mustard seed, he says, you could move mountains. And what's interesting, you know, when he put that seed, as small as that seed is, when you plant it, you know how big that bush becomes? Huge. That's kind of like us. God will take the little bit of faith you have, you go, well, Michael, I just... Just don't have that much. Just, God says, look, just give me what you got. Give me what you got. And by the way, do you know how to get faith? Unlike wisdom. Wisdom, how do we get wisdom? We pray for it. Now look, I, I'm an ex-drug addict, okay? Don't tell anybody this, but uh, oh, so forget it. It's already being recorded. I, I'm an ex-drug addict. I mean, I probably fried half of my brains out a long time ago, okay? Hey, that, there's nothing I can do about that. Okay, yeah, my wife takes good care of me. She gives me a lot of vitamins, you know. And, but I ain't going to replace what I got. Brains, but God gave you some brains, hey, hang on to them. Wisdom, on the other hand, is a whole different deal. The Bible says pray for wisdom. And you know what, to be honest with you, I think I would have wisdom, more wisdom than intellect. I have, I, I have seen so many people that are so brainiac, but yet common sense and wisdom, they just, because that comes from God. So ask for wisdom, and God will give it to you. So number one, God had arranged this meeting between Philip and the Ethiopian. Number two, God wouldn't have directed Philip unless God had already opened the door. Now, you know what? There might be something going on in your, your life right now, which is this, a closed door. Closed doors sometimes are not fun, are they? Because they're scary. It's kind of like, let's make a deal. Do you want door number one, door number two, door number three? Now, the thing is, you don't know what's going on behind the door. Usually it's some good prize. But in the spiritual world, God's saying, look, I got it all in control. I'm going to close this door here, which is going to have to force you to go to this door. But again, God, won't, God wouldn't have directed Philip again unless God had already arranged an open door. You know, one of, our, one of the greatest jobs in preaching or teaching or hearing the gospel is to simply pray for an open door. You could be at the store. You could be at the gas station. You could be anywhere. And you can just say, Lord, give me an open door today. Could you open a door for me? And let me tell you, try it. You know sooner to say that and all of a sudden some guy will come up to you and say, Hey man, I saw your cross or... or uh, um, you know, I, I got a situation here. I don't know why. I don't even know you, but uh, just try it. God can open some awesome doors. Why was Philip an effective evangelist? Because he knew how to flow with the Holy Spirit. He knew how to flow with the Holy Spirit. When you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you have a spirit, obviously, a little s. But when you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in, the third part of the Trinity. You know, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, three different persons, okay? 
I love this at the truck stop. I tell these guys all the time, I go, you know, God's name is not God. Oh my gosh, y'all see the looks I get. God's name is not God? You mean he's not God? No, that's, that's not what I said. I said, look, let me ask you a question. And usually we'll have maybe 10, 15 people, maybe, maybe on a good, good, good day, we might have 30 show up for a Sunday morning. And we'll ask them, go, what's your name? Who do you drive for? I said, notice when I asked you your name, you didn't tell me professional truck driver because that's your title. Well, that's what God, God is a title. What is his name? Yahweh. I am who I am. That's his name. That's how you can have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, why was Philip an effective evangelist? Because he flew with the Holy Spirit. He was not led by his own whims, his own feelings. You've got to be careful when you do that. You really do. I don't know about you, but I've made so many stupid, crazy mistakes thinking, especially when I was in the business world, oh my gosh. I thought, well, maybe, man, that looks like a pretty good deal. <laughs> yeah, one time I did that and lost whew, a ton of money. But anyway, he was not led by his own whims and feelings, but by the Holy Spirit. Now, look what he says here about understanding. So Philip ran him and heard him reading the book of the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? I love this word, this word understand. The word here is gnosko. Gnosko. The word means to it means aware, comprehend, perceive, realize, recognize. In other words, he says, "Do you comprehend what you're saying? Do you, are you comprehending what you're reading? Are you, do you realize what you're reading?" So I like what, how he answers. He says, and he said, "Well, how 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 can I, unless someone?" guides me, or instructs me, or teaches me. That's why you go to Bible studies, because that's how you learn. And by the way, that's how your faith grows. Remember in the book of Romans, it says faith comes by what? Hearing, hearing and hearing by the word. word of God. Not like joy, I mean, not like, well, not like, well, joy, uh, joy is a whole other thing. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But wisdom, you get wisdom by asking. Faith, you can't get that by you. You can't go, Lord, can I have a pound of faith? No, it doesn't work that way. You have to read. You read your word. That's how you would get your faith. And then he says, how can I unless someone guides me? You know, all of us need guidance. Everyone. That's why you go to Bible study. That's why in the book of Hebrews it said, do not forsake the assembling of one. Do not, do not forsake the assembling. You know, it's kind of like this. You ever been to a barbecue? Pretty much anymore, everything is propane. But remember in the old days, they used the little, those little briskets? And the way they do, they pile them up and they fire them up and they get real hot and cook the meat, right? Well, have you ever taken one little brisket and put them by himself? The poor little guy feels so lonely. And after a while, you're looking at him, he's about half dead. And he's not looking, he looks like he's wilted. Because he's not fellowshipping with the rest of the briquettes. Poor guy. You know, just look at yourself as a little brocat. Okay? And you hang around with other Christians, you know what? You're going to grow. Hear the word of God. You're going to grow. Now, this is a proper question of anyone who wants to understand the Bible. We should never feel bad if we need to be taught before we can understand things. See, some people get so pig-headed, right? They're so pig-headed, they go, oh, phew. I've been a Christian for two weeks and 21 days, or I've been a Christian for 33 years. I know it all. You know, they're, they're kind of like the adolescent. You can't tell an adolescent anything. At 13, at 12, they know everything. They know everything. Sometimes Christians can be, Christians can be the same way. You know, uh, I've been reading the Bible for 30 years. I know everything. You know nothing. Are you kidding? We know nothing. There is so much. There's 66 books in this Bible. I mean, every time you go through it, you see something new. Anytime. So to get anything from our Bibles, what we got to do? We have to plug into a church. Now, there's two ways to read your Bible. Two ways to read your Bible. You can be like the butterfly. You ever watch a butterfly? All a butterfly does is this, right? Just flies around. Here's the flower. He just flies around, looking at it. 
That's one way to read your Bible. You just kind of go through it, you know. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Then you got the other one, the bee. A bee. You ever watch a busy bee? Oh, those guys are cool. What do they do? They fly around, fly, they fly around that, fl that flower, and then what? Shroom! They plunge right in, going for it, carrying away the good food. That's how we need to be with our Bibles. You can either be a butterfly or you can be a bee. Well, if you can be a butterfly, you ain't going to grow too much. But you be like a bee, you start eating, and you're going to sting like a bee. So when people start, when they hear you, man, they go, wow, this guy's what? This guy's been in the Word. This guy's been in the Word. One thing about the Ethiopian, I like what he was reading. He was reading Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. And let's read that again. He says, He was led as a sheep before, to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his hum humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. By the way, whenever you're speaking to a Jew, okay, a Jew means to get the Jew, Jew came from the word Judah. It's one of the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's uh, boys. That's where the word Jew came from, by the way. And by the way, the word Judah means praise. praise. Yeah. And this is okay. You can do this. You know, you go, oh, Michael, get your hands down. You're making me uncomfortable. Okay? No, the Bible talks about lifting your hands to God. Oh, by the way, how many Vietnam veterans do we have in here? Yeah. Any more? Yeah, right on. Me too, brother. You know, when I was in Vietnam, remember Chu Hoi? Remember the word Chu Hoi? When I was in Vietnam, they told me, oh, by the way, Michael, um, and I was 19 and a half years old, but I, I'll never forget. I'm 60 years old now. I'll never forget. I'll never forget this word. They said, Michael, if you feel something in the back of you, just go like this. I'm thinking, I thought that's what fanatics do. I go, no, just go like this. You know what this is? It's a universal sign of what? Surrender. Surrender. No matter where you go in the world, I don't care if you speak the language or not. Some guy wants to hit you and you don't know... Just go like that. They know exactly what you mean. It's, it's just, it's a universal sign of surrender. So, was it a coincidence that he was reading Isaiah 53, 7 through 8 when Philip came up? No. Because God knew, Philip, I got it all under control. And Philip's probably going, no, God, you don't. I'm leaving this awesome ministry to go to the desert? And he's going, no, it's cool, it's all right, you go. And not only that, he wasn't reading some off-the-wall, something out of uh, Leviticus. God, you ever read the book of Leviticus? God, that'll put you to sleep. You know, I tell you, if you have a hard time sleeping, <laughs> pick up the book of Leviticus, read it, you'll fall asleep just like that. Well, he wasn't reading the book of Leviticus, he was reading Isaiah 53, 7 through 8. And I love it because after he read it, the eunuch was, um, well, before we go there, I'm going to look at a couple, a couple things here. Number one, there's three thoughts here the Jew would look at when they're reading this book of Isaiah. Number one, they thought that the suffering servant was the nation of Israel. That's who they thought this scripture was for. Then some thought, well, no, it's about Isaiah. It's about Isaiah. That's why, remember the eunuch saying, well, who is this about? Is this, is this about uh, the prophet? It, heard, it says, is this about the prophet Isaiah? That's what some thought. Then the last one, some thought that it was the suffering servant, the Messiah. But the problem was, was that they didn't want to look at the Messiah as a suffering servant. Who wants a suffering Messiah? No, man, we want... You know, big strong guy. We don't want no wimpy suffering Messiah. So they had a real problem with this scripture. I like what one pastor said. He said, today too many preachers focus on what we must do for God. No. But the gospel begins with what God has done for us in Jesus. You know, if you learn more about what Jesus has done for you, it makes it so easy when you, when you have to step out there and do stuff for him. So, which is true because we can't be saved by doing things for God. We are saved by what Jesus has done for us. Now, look at verse 35 here. Well, verse 34. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself? Which is what some of them thought. Or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at this scripture preached 
Jesus to him. Now, you know, most people don't like being preached to. You know that? You ever try to tell you? You know, when people, I can remember when I first got saved way back in the hippie days. And my dad, who was a retired military man at that point, died an alcoholic, but praise God, my wife brought him to the Lord two days before he died. But I can remember when I got saved. And I had my long hair and my buttons, and you know, I mean, I just thought, I, I found it. I, I found the pot of gold. I mean, you couldn't tell me any different. And I remember when I went home to talk to my dad and tell him about the Lord. And I remember the first thing he told me. He stuck his finger in my face. He says, don't preach to me. I was shocked. Dad, I'm not a preacher. I wish he's alive to see me now. But he goes, <laughs> I go, Dad, I'm not a preacher. I, Genesis, where's Genesis at? I didn't know anything about anything. All I knew was that I asked Christ to come in my heart. Man, that just changed my whole life. That's all I knew. But check this out, verse 35, where, he's, where he says that he preached to him. The word preach is the word you and jello. You and jello. The word EU means good, and jello is the word announce. So what he's actually referring to is he's actually sharing the full gospel of, of Christ. Or actually, to put it another way, is called gospelizing. So next time somebody goes, hey man, will you quit preaching to me? Look, I'm not trying to preach to you. I'm just trying to share the good news. That's all. I'm, I'm, no, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, preaching. Don't, just, no, don't even go there. Just look at it like... I'm just sharing some good news for you. Then look at verse 36. It says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? In other words, the, the Ethiopian is ready to respond to the gospel. And he's asking, What hinders me or what restrains me from being baptized? Now obviously, this was the work of the Holy Spirit. This, wasn't, this isn't a tribute to Philip's salesmanship. Um, long story short, I was, uh, 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 I was adopted and brought here when I was five years old from England. And uh, my mother didn't see our family for 60 years. And we got to go, as God would have it, we found him through the internet. And we went over there and we hooked back up. And my uncle James, I just fell in love with the guy. And uh, he came over here to visit us. And I took him, we took him to a... Uh, um, I go to Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, and way back when they were having uh, uh, the guy, the potter, uh, Mike, Mike, uh, Mike and Pam Roselle. Yeah, Mike and Pam Roselle. You guys ever seen him? Yeah. You got to go if you haven't. It's awesome. What he does, he does these clay pots, and then he, uh, he puts this red dye, the, and it looks like blood. It's just really powerful. Well, he gives the altar call, and all these people are going up. And my uncle, to this day, I still don't know if he, if he was just trying to make fun of it or if he was serious, because he was a salesman. He goes, now, Michael, that man's a good salesman. Did you see how he got them people up there? I'm thinking, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> this was not the work. This was the work, I should say, of the Holy Spirit, not a tribute to Philip's salesmanship. Now, you got to love this. Verse 37. And then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. We're going to camp on on this word if just for a couple minutes here. How many times the Bible says, um, well, let's just use this one. He says, if you believe. You know what the word if really means? Unless. Unless. You know, the Bible says in John 3, 3, unless you are born again or you will not see the kingdom of God. That's the word if. Remember when, when Satan came to Jesus and says, if you're the son of God? Bad translation. In the actual Greek, it's not if. Come on. Satan knew who Jesus was. Are you kidding? In the beginning, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit created the heavens and the earth. Uh, Jesus said, before Abraham, I am. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So come on, Jesus has always been. Satan was there, he saw it. So when Satan came, they didn't come to Jesus and go, well, Jesus, hmm, I got a bad memory. Uh, if you're the son of God, no. Since you're the son of God, that's what that word if means. So now on, when you're reading your Bibles, you see that word if, in the Greek, it's the word since. So, he says, now when you read it, he said, Philip said, if or unless or until you believe 
with all your heart, you may. And he answered, he said what? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So what did he do? He believed. By the way, that word believe in the Greek is the word pistio. you got to watch how you say this one. Pistio. It means to have faith in or to have faith in, upon, or with. Faith with, upon, or with. Which is interesting, the three prepositions of the Holy Spirit. With, in, and upon. How does that work? You're not a Christian. You walk in here, let's assume, let's assume there's somebody in here who doesn't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. So you're coming in here going, well, you know, it's just a short walk and they got free uh, uh, orange juice and, you know, the product's good. And I'll ah, just come out and hang out. Well, guess what? No, you're not here by accident. Well, first of all, you got the Holy Spirit. He's here. He's here. Trust me. He's with you. What do you mean he's with me? He's with you. He's coming, he's, he's coming alongside you. Okay? So he's with you. Then, with in the second preposition is when you ask Christ to come in your heart, what? No longer is he just with you. Now he comes in you. Then you've got that other part where it comes upon. That's when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Some people, and it's just a gift. Some people speak in tongues. Uh, the Holy Spirit will just give you, like, I think, what, 21, 22 or more different gifts out there that he can give you. So again, that's what believe means. And also to commit. When you believe, you commit. So he answered, he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down, check it out, went down into the water, and he baptized him. This word baptized actually means to be immersed. That's what it means. That's what the baptized, the word baptized means to be immersed. In other words, you go down into the water. Now, I let some people go, I'll, they'll come in the chapel and go say, hey man, I know, I know you got to leave, got a quick question. If you died right now, would you go to heaven? Oh yeah. I go, and why is that? Well, two, two, two of the big ones. Number one, well, I was baptized as a child. Okay, wrong. And number two, I'm a good person. Good, wrong. In other words, baptism doesn't save you because it's all baptism is is an outward showing of an inward thing. And second of all, you're again saved by grace, not by works. So these people, when they come in, they go, oh yeah, well, I'm a good guy. I go, you know what? I, I am so glad. I love good people. I'd rather have you as a neighbor than the guy next door is a bad person. But both of you got the same problem. You're SIN positive, not HIV. You're SIN positive. You need that antidote. The only antidote that can take that away is the blood of Jesus. So, he got baptized, and then verse 39, now here comes the best part, we're going to close with this. Now, when they came up out of the water, again, the Spirit, remember the same Spirit, capital S, the same one that told um, Philip to go over to the, take the desert way, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. This is your word harpazo that you find in 1 Thessalonians 4 through 15. Remember the rapture, we call it the rapture of the church, it's the word harpazo. Okay, it means to see, when people go, yeah, when people say, I don't see the word rapture in the Bible. So you're right. It's the word caught up. That's where we get our word rapture. It means to seize, to catch up, to snatch away, to pluck, to pull, to take by force. So, Look what happened here. He was caught up away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Astos and passing through he preached to all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So you know what was cool? Here, here he is. Here he's, that's 34 miles away. He gets caught up and he goes 34 miles away. So here's Philip. He starts his ministry in Samaria, goes north to Gaza, uh, which is on the south coast. Then he gets transported to Ashdod, and then he works his way all the way up to Caesarea, which was another 55 miles. This guy did some, he should have been a truck driver. I mean, this guy did some trucking, to say the least. And all along, sharing the gospel. God wants you to do the same thing. God wants you to share the gospel. And you might be saying this morning, you know what, Michael? I'm, I'm behind you 100%. I, I want to share the gospel. But here's the problem. I was a Christian. I accepted the Lord yesterday, two years ago, five years ago. I haven't been walking with the Lord. And I feel like I've let God down. 
I let God down. Got some good news for you. You can't let God down. You can't. You know why? Because you're not lifting Him up. How can you let somebody down? You don't lift God up. God lifts you up. So how can you let God down? See, people, we get hung up, we make a mistake, we slip and fall, we go, oh, I'm so, feel, oh, I'm so, I'm so bad, I let God down. God says, no, you didn't, because you're not lifting me up. You're not keeping me up. Keep myself up. 